Morning. Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Khan at one point says there's an old Klingon proverb that says revenge is a dish that is best served cold. Everybody knows. Do you remember the Princess Bride? Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You kill my father, prepare to die. Come on, come on. And when he finally sticks his sword into the six-fingered man, oh, feels so good, doesn't it? Feels so, so good. And when Maximus gets up in Gladiator and calls himself commander of the armies of the north, general of the Felix legions, father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance in this life or the next, we go, oh, so good. Amen. Quentin Tarantino needed four hours and two full movies to finally kill Bill. <laughs> and when they dared to murder John Wick's little puppy, hundreds of people had to die. Across three movies, chapter four is coming this March. There, hundreds more will die. Movie five is on the way. So... We have a bit of a love affair with vengeance, don't we? I mean, that's just a small smattering of movies that I could give you. There are a whole lot more. A whole lot of stories in our past and in our culture where the dream of the movie is something bad happens to a person and then they spend the whole rest of the time getting their vengeance. And it feels so good to us. Exodus chapter 21, 23 says, But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Now we know that. We know eye for an eye, and that's where it comes from. But as Christians, as religious people, what we often don't do is read scripture in its context and look at what it's really saying. And if you look at that particular scripture, eye for eye, it says two things in the context that we missed. Number one, it is not talking about personal vengeance, one person to another. It's talking to judges and magistrates and civil officials bringing social justice in a particular court case, doing it in their official capacity like our policemen and our judges do today. But the second thing is that this was a limitation on justice. So, you know, these days when a judge renders a particular verdict and a, and, and a sentence for what was done, there is usually guidance written into the law that says for this particular kind of crime, it should be a minimum of this and a maximum of this. And then they do a sentence somewhere in between. This was God coming into that culture at the time and saying, here is guidance for you on how justice should be carried out because some judges would go too small. Like if someone came and bribed the judge and said, even though I did this, why don't you look the other way and give me a very small punishment? God here is saying, don't make it too small. That's not just. But also, don't go crazy. Don't make a punishment that so far exceeds the original crime. What God is saying when he says eye for an eye is let the punishment fit the crime in your social just society. But of course, we don't leave it there, do we? And so by the time Jesus came on the scene, the Pharisees and the religious people had already taken this idea from the Old Testament and they had turned eye for an eye into personal vengeance and into an excuse to violently attack people who had violently attacked them, make just or vengeance seem okay. So Jesus says in Matthew 5, 38, you have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. 
Do you see what Jesus is doing? He's not saying, walk around and ask people to slap you. Right? That's not it. But he's saying, no personal vengeance for Christians. He's saying, if somebody comes at you, you don't get to give it right back to them. Very, very important. And then Romans 12, verse 19 says, Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Now, I love this verse because, partly because it gives us an important truth. And that is if someone hurts us, someone harms us, an inner sense of justice rises up inside of us, doesn't it? And says they need to pay for what they did. There needs to be justice. There needs to be punishment. And that inner sense of justice rises up in us and it needs to be satisfied. And God knows that because he's the one who made us the way that we are. And God says, I get it. I get that you want punishment, but here's the thing. You don't deliver the punishment yourself. It's mine to repay, says the Lord. I'll take care of it. You're gonna have to trust me. Because sometimes we might go a little too far. And sometimes our heart may never be satisfied and we may keep the punishment going and going and going and going. And so God says, I'll bring the punishment. And God will bring the punishment. And he surely will. For everybody's sin in this world, he'll bring it in two ways. One of two ways. First and foremost, people may pay for their own sins through punishment in hell. And God will pour that out on them. The second option is that if anyone would reach out to Jesus Christ, God will pour out the punishment that they deserve onto his son and his son will suffer in their place. And we should long for the second option. We should long for the second option because that's what we want for ourselves and we should long for it for others as well. Martin Luther King Jr. said it like this. He said, the old law of eye for an eye leaves everyone blind. It destroys communities, makes humanity impossible. It creates bitterness in the survivors and brutality in the destroyers. Here's what Martin Luther King's trying to say. There's a lie at the end of the Princess Bride movie. Because what happens is after he stabs the six-fingered man and he gets his revenge, Inigo Montoya, he has a big smile on his face and he joins his friends and they all ride off into the sunset seemingly to happily live ever after. But you and I both know, we know that's not how it really goes with personal vengeance. That when we get our vengeance, something actually starts to darken inside of us. And Martin Luther King Jr. was right that it brings in a bitterness. It starts to make us barbaric and more and more aggressive in our punishments that we give to each other. And some of you are like, well, we're not murderers here today. And I hope not. But what about that ex-spouse? What about the things that they did to you? And don't you want punishments back toward them? And what about that mother? What about that father who treated you that way and did that thing when you were young? And don't you want to bring? And don't they deserve? Isn't that that where it really meets us? Is the tiny little punishments that we want to bring to them, it's it's the tiny um, silent treatments. It's the tiny moments of talking about them behind their back and making sure that their friends know this thing that they did. Sometimes it's even a social media slam on them, right? And outing them about a particular thing. Or it's just run-of-the-mill disrespect and relational distance that goes across decades. As Christians, we like our personal vengeance. We just don't call it that. It's our tiny punishments. And God wants to deal with that in us. Revenge is rotting you. Revenge is robbing you. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, as we go deeper into the story of Joseph today, Lord, I ask that you would start to open our hearts, God, and that you would speak to us in such a clear voice that we can't deny you. And God, I pray that the way that you speak to our voice, or the, the way that you speak to our hearts today, 
that God, you would speak so personally and individually to all of us, God, in this room and those who are watching online as well. God, I pray that you would just reach out to us no matter where we are because Holy Spirit, you're capable of doing that. So call us to more, Lord. Call us to the way of Jesus. In Christ's name, amen. So we're in the story of Joseph, and we're going to come back to the princess bride later, okay? In the story of Joseph, this is week five in the series of Joseph. We've been talking about this young man in the book of Genesis named Joseph and how he started when he was 17 years old. And if this is your first Sunday with us, I'm just going to catch you up really, really fast. But this 17-year-old boy, he was one of 12 brothers and he was his dad's favorite. Why was he his favorite? Because his dad had multiple wives, which is a bad idea. Amen? It's a bad idea, and he had one wife that was his favorite, and her name was Rachel, and she had two sons, Joseph and Benjamin, and Joseph was the older one, and he became the favorite, and that meant that all the other brothers were not their dad's favorite, and they felt it. And when they felt it, they got so angry, and they lived in that anger and bitterness, and they finally lashed out against him, and they had him sold into slavery in Egypt, and he spends 13 years as a slave, and then eventually in prison, In Egypt, from 17 to 30 years old, the the younger adult years of his life are gone. Prison and slavery. And we've been talking for a few weeks now how the miracle of the story of Joseph up to this point is the fact that he does not get embittered. The miracle is that this young man, with everything that's happened to him, does not write off God and run away from God. Instead, he runs to God and he holds on to God in the middle of the prison like an anchor for his soul. And we don't all do that. But he did and he inspires us and he's a miracle for it. And so last week, everything completely turned around and Joseph comes into Pharaoh's um, uh, throne room and there's a dream, if you remember, and he interprets the dream. And the dream is gonna mean that there's seven years where Egypt is going to have lots and lots of food, lots of extra, everybody's gonna get rich. But seven years right after that, there's gonna be a famine and then everybody's gonna starve to death and it's gonna decimate the country. And Joseph comes in And with the divine spark in him, not only does he interpret the dream, tell Pharaoh what's going to happen, but he gives him a plan and says, we're going to store all the food for seven years. So then the seven years of famine, we're going to be able to survive and we'll thrive. And Pharaoh loves the plan. He makes him prime minister of all Egypt, which is another miracle in the story. So Joseph goes from slavery and in prison to suddenly the second most powerful person in the most powerful country in the ancient world, Egypt. And he's wealthy, and he's important, and he has purpose instantly. And so fast forward to today, and the passage that I'm about to read to you is eight years after that moment. Eight years after that moment, some things are going to happen in the ancient world, and it's going to bring to bear Joseph's brothers back to him. So the seven years of plenty have already happened, and we're one year into the famine. And I'm going to start reading to you at Genesis 42, verse 3. One year into the famine. So Joseph's ten older brothers went down to Egypt to buy grain. But Jacob, this is, this is the old deadbeat dad Jacob, right, who had favorites. Remember him? But Jacob would not let Joseph's younger brother Benjamin go with them for fear that some harm might come to him. So Jacob's sons arrived in Egypt along with others to buy food for the famine was in Canaan as well. And the scripture is just telling us that this famine wasn't just in Egypt. It was in the entire ancient world. And so Canaan, which is about 250 miles away, about two weeks um, travel distance. They travel in caravans and it took them a long time about two weeks travel distance away, they were feeling the famine as well. But did you notice the stuff about Benjamin there? So old dad Jacob said, you can't take Benjamin, the youngest son. But why not, dad? It's a dangerous trip. Yeah, it's dangerous for the other 10 of us too. Yeah, but you can't take Benjamin. Something might happen to him. Do you see what old dad Jacob has done? He's found a new favorite. He thinks his favorite, Joseph, is dead. We covered that in week one. He's got himself a new favorite. 
This is years later. This is, this is years later, everything had happened, 21 years later. And Jacob is still doing the same things he had always done. Had you, have you ever left your family and gone somewhere else to work and you kind of grow up and you kind of like move past some of the things in your family and then all of a sudden you go back for Christmas and you're around people and you hear them talk and you're like, wow, <laughs> you're all doing the same things you always did. <laughs> somebody, somebody in our marriage class on Friday said, sometimes old people don't get wiser, they just get older. <laughs> okay, so verse 6. So Joseph was governor of all Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all the people. And it was him that his brothers, it was to him, sorry, that his brothers came. And when they arrived, they bowed before him with their faces on the ground. Now you Bible students here, you know that this moment where he's, he's here in his official capacity and they're all there and they're bowing to their brother, you know that that's the fulfillment of the great dream that he had in week one. So immediately, it's a big, big deal. He sees the hand of God. He sees that God knew this moment was going to happen all along. All this is rushing into Joseph's mind. Now, the other thing that you need to know about this moment is they don't know it's Joseph, but he knows it's them. Okay, so, so he was 17 when they sold him. He was young, and now he's quite a bit older, 21 years older. He's changed a lot. He's now in Egyptian attire. He might have grown a beard. I don't know what it was but he looks different and he sounds different because he's not speaking to them in Hebrew. You'll learn later in the passage that he's speaking through an Egyptian interpreter. So he's speaking Egyptian and the interpreter's speaking the Hebrew to them. They don't know it's him, but he knows it's them. So what happens now? Verse seven, thus Joseph picked up yonder sword and screaming to his brothers, you killed my father, prepare to die. He slew his brothers forthwith. I'll give you a second. <laughs> Some of you just woke up. You're like, what? What? What just happened? <laughs> that is not what happened. <laughs> but they deserved for it to happen. Because here he stands. And they've been terrible to him. And he's now been given power over them. If he did grab a sword, it would have been over and nobody would have stopped him and nobody would have blamed him. He's got too much power. Do you think he could have wielded it? Of course. Do you think he could have interpreted the situation? And over-spiritualized the whole thing and said, God wouldn't have brought them right here in my power if he didn't want me to act on it. He could have told himself that. And it would have felt so good. But he doesn't do it. Why? Because revenge would have rotted Joseph's soul. It would have impacted him. So what actually happens, if you, if you, I'm going to skip over some passages because this is like a three-chapter section, so I'm going to have to skip over some stuff. But I'll tell you what happens is instead of slaughtering his brothers right here, instead he acts mad at them and he accuses them of being spies who have invaded Egypt and they're trying to ba basically case out the country so that they can come and invade later. And he throws all the brothers in jail for three days. And you have to kind of read between the lines and wonder why he threw him in jail for three days. Did he think maybe I just won't ever pull him back out? I don't know. They had done it to him. But after three days, he decides to go ahead and pull him back out of jail. And he makes a deal with them. He says, I'm going to send you with food in your bags back to Canaan, back to where my father is, back to where Benjamin is, back to where the family is still located. I want you guys to survive this famine, so I'm sending you back with food. He only sends them about enough for maybe a year or several months, we don't know, but he sends them back enough that they think they're gonna be okay. And he says, but I'm gonna keep one of the brothers hostage in jail. Because Joseph knows this thing's gonna last seven years. He knows they've gotta come back. So he says, I'm going to keep one of the brothers hostage in jail. And he's like, and next time you come, I want you to bring Benjamin, the favorite. 
and, and they're, you know, they know it's going to be so hard to bring Je- uh, Benjamin. But they go because, again, they don't know how long this thing's going to last. And right as he says all of this to them, the brothers have a little, so again, imagine them here. They have a little discussion amongst themselves, but they have the discussion in Hebrew because they don't think this weird Egyptian official is going to be able to understand them. So here's what they say. This is 42 verse 21. Speaking among themselves, they said, clearly we are being punished because of what we did to Joseph long ago. We saw his anguish when he pleaded for his life, but we wouldn't listen. That's why we're in this trouble. And of course, they didn't know that Joseph understood them. Now he turned away from them and he began to weep. Can you just appreciate the comedy of this moment right here? As he's standing here and he understands everything that they're saying and they're talking about him and they're totally admitting everything that they've done. But what else are they admitting? They're admitting that they have been haunted for 21 years at what they've done. Not just guilt, but they're interpreting the danger of this moment as God's punishment for them for what they did a long time ago. So what do you think they've been doing for 21 years? Every single bad thing in their life, they've seen as God's punishment for what they did to Joseph 21 years ago. Have you ever lived like that? You did the bad thing? And you feel like God just keeps... And that's not the Bible. That's not the way that it works. Quick word on Joseph. I think he's a conflicted guy here. There's a lot more that I'm about to share with you in the other chapters. And you're going to see what I would call erratic behavior from him. There's sometimes he's weeping over his brothers because he's so emotionally overcome, right? The rush of emotions and everything. And other times he's throwing them in jail and he's not sure if he's going to bring them back out again. Sometimes it looks like he's going to trap them. He's fine with sticking one of their brothers in jail. He doesn't know if they're actually going to come back. So there's some real erratic behavior from this guy. I'll just tell you, if you read the commentators on this, some people read the story of Joseph and they think that he is such a holy, perfect saint of a guy. They read all of his actions and they say, surely he knew exactly the way to bring these guys to perfect repentance. This was all selfless the whole time. And if you want to read the story that way, you are absolutely welcome to because I'm not sure I'm right either. The Old Testament scripture in this section It does not tell us what they were thinking. It just gives us the facts. And we're left to read between the lines. So the way I read between the lines is I think, and Pastor Ricky covered this on week three, I think when Joseph was spending all that time in prison, day after day in prison, I think he found his peace with God. And he got his soul settled and he left the past behind him. And I 100% believe that. But it's one thing to heal apart from the people that have traumatized you and to have your peace. And then all of a sudden, the people that have traumatized you are in your face. Some of you guys have healed from, from some stuff. And all of a sudden, you go back to your high school reunion and there they are. And it's a whole different deal. And that's what I think our boy Joseph is facing right now. And I think he's rattled. And I think he's trying to figure out what to do. And I think he's healed with the Lord, but I don't think he's healed with them exactly quite yet. And I think he's putting it together. So that's that's just my read on it. Okay, so the brothers don't know any of that's happening. So the brothers are like, okay, you'll give us food. You're gonna keep the one brother in jail. Okay, fine. We'll go back to Canaan. They do. They travel the 250 miles back, the two weeks back, and they get back to their dad and it's a big dangerous trip and they give their dad the food and they're like, we're gonna be okay. And he's like, but they, he's gonna need Benjamin if we go back again. And old dad Jacob says, no, you're not touching my favorite. And old dad Jacob thinks they're going to be okay because this famine's not going to last very long. And of course, it is going to last a full seven years. Eventually, they do run out of food and they have to go back maybe a year later. (laughs) Poor poor brother, by the way, has been in jail for a year. (laughs) And so old dad Jacob, he finally gives him Benjamin, says, go ahead and go. I guess we have to. And so, yeah. So then they travel back. Now, again, there's a bunch of additional detail that you'll find in the scripture, and I highly recommend reading it all through yourself, but let me, let me summarize. When they get back to Egypt with Benjamin 
and they need more food. This time, Joseph treats them different. It feels like he's had a little bit more time to think this through. And instead of coming to the palace, he has them go to his personal house, and he sets up a banquet for them this time. So this is trip number two to Egypt. He sets up a banquet, and he brings out the brother from prison and said, okay, you guys kept your end of the bargain. Great. Now we'll have this feast. He treats them personally. He actually does this weird thing where he gives Benjamin five times the amount of food that he gives to everybody else, which is just like tweaking that whole favoritism thing. I'm not sure why he does that. Again, I think he's a little bit erratic sometimes. And so then he says, okay, so here's your food. and You're going to be fine. And he sends them back to Canaan again. But this time, he sets up a little test. He grabs this fancy silver cup, and it's super wealthy cup, right? And he hides it in Benjamin's food sack. And he does it all super on the sly. He sends them back to Canaan like everything's fine. And it's, he gives them just long enough. As soon as they get out of town, he sends a group of soldiers after him. And the soldiers arrest them all, bring them back, open up their sacks. And there's the silver cup in Benjamin's sack. And he's like, no problem. I'll just put Benjamin in jail for the rest of his life because of what he's done. The rest of you can go on home. <laughs> Do you see what he's doing? He's setting up a test for them. He's setting up a test for them with two options. Option one, we go ahead and we let Benjamin go into prison for the rest of his life. We sacrifice one brother and the rest of us will be comfortable for the rest of our lives. Yeah, old man Jacob, he'll go through some pain, but he's a jerk anyway. Do we really care? So that's option one. Option two is we risk our own necks, I guess. And we try to save Benjamin and we might get thrown in prison. I... Two really, really difficult options presented to them. And let me just say this really quick before I tell you what happens next is Joseph is testing the character of the brothers. He's testing the level of their heart repentance. I think this particular moment is super, super risky, and I do not recommend it. I don't recommend any Christian ever test somebody else's repentance. I think that gets you in a really, really scary place. Why? Because he's emotional and he's confused. And if you really think through his little scenario logically, it could have backfired in a nasty way. I think sometimes as Christians, we think that we're um, qualified and valid to test people's repentance with us. But I would say testing people in a situation like that is like revenge light. Because what are you doing? You're setting yourself up as the judge. Are we qualified to be the judge? No. We're, 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 we're above them. We're waiting on them, right? They've got something to prove to us. And we are righteously justified in delaying our forgiveness until they prove it. That's, that's what we're telling ourselves. I'm going to wait you out. I'm not going to forgive you. I'm not going to give you freedom. I'm not going to give you my respect and my love until you have proved it. And that till you have proved it part could last a really long time. Don't test people. I don't think we're qualified. And I think it rots our souls, just like revenge does. Okay, so that's the test. In this moment, Judah is about to speak. If you weren't here week one, let me just remind you about Judah. Judah is a bad guy. Judah, when they throw Joseph in the pit in the very first week, Judah is the guy that says, I know we could kill him, but let's not kill him because then we'd have to deal with his body. And that sounds like more work than I want to do. Instead, let's sell this guy into slavery. That's Judah, not the coolest guy in the world. This is Judah 21 years ago. So watch what Judah says now. He's about to step up. Genesis 44:30. And now, my Lord, I cannot go back to my father's house without the boy. 
Our father's life is bound up in the boy's life. If he sees that the boy is not with us, our father will die, and we, his servants, will indeed be responsible for sending that grieving, white-haired man to his grave. Weird, Judah, it sounds like you love your dad. So please, my Lord, let me stay here as a slave instead of the boy, and let the boy return with his brothers. This is Judah talking. 21 years. And what's Judah doing? Judah just said, I'll go ahead and go to prison for the rest of my life. And you send Benjamin home so that Benjamin, Benjamin will be okay and my dad will be okay. Sometimes we believe the lie that this world gives us that people cannot change. Judah just changed. His life, his heart, his character. What happened in 21 years? Do you think Joseph was floored by that speech? You bet he was. Where in the world did you come from? And for you Bible nerds out there like me, what Judah just did, the theologians call it substitutionary atonement. What Judah just did is said, how about you punish my entire life so that everybody else can go free? How about you punish my entire life so that Benjamin and Jacob will be okay and my entire family will be okay. I'll lay my own neck on the line. Substitutionary atonement is what our Lord did when he went on the cross and he died for our sins. And he said, I will die and I will suffer so that none of them have to die. Amen. Judah just walked in the way of the Savior before he even knew about a Savior. That's amazing. And again, we we dealt with in week one and week two that when the Messiah would come, he would come through what tribe? Judah. Judah. He would be the lion of the tribe of Judah. And all of a sudden we see what God might have had in mind. This is the one who walks in substitutionary atonement, just like our Lord the Messiah would walk in substitutionary atonement. And God connected all the dots for us. Amen? This is amazing stuff. And Jesus saved his whole family and Judah saved his whole family. My goodness. Genesis 45.1. Here's how Joseph reacts. Joseph could stand it no longer. There were many people in the room. And so he said to all servants, all his attendants, he said, out, all of you. He was just too emotional. So he was alone with his brothers in the room when he told them who he was. And then he broke down and wept. And he said, I'm Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. Of course they were. (laughs) could you imagine everything that's rushing at them right now and so he has to say it to him again he's like i am joseph your brother whom you sold into slavery in egypt and i've got to imagine right there at that moment benjamin's like wait a second what i thought you had died and they said you had died and he's putting everything together and you can bet later on dad jacob is going to put it all together as well so there's some there's some truth here in this moment that's a bit uncomfortable, but then he's going to speak forgiveness. Verse 5, don't, but don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years, and there, there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. He's forgiving them. Do you see it? Do you see his forgiveness? And these right here, these words, these might be the most powerful forgiveness words in your entire Bible. They're massive. Take them in for a second. If you're going to teach somebody, if you're going to teach a young Christian how to forgive, here's the practical way that you walk in forgiveness because forgiveness is one of those words, isn't it? In the church, I forgave. What do you mean by that? Because sometimes we say forgiveness and it's this tiny surfacey thing. And other times it's a deep thing. This is deep forgiveness. This is real forgiveness. What's he saying here? He's saying, listen, listen, brothers, I I could throw you in jail. I could end you. I could could at least give you the silent treatment for a few decades. But I'm not, I'm not going to use any of my tiny little punishments against you. And not only that, but I don't want you to punish yourself. That's what he's saying. 
don't be upset. Don't be angry at yourself for everything that you've done. I get it, but I see a bigger picture, and I'd like you to see a bigger picture too. Do you know the kindness and mercy of that? How many times is a Christian forgiven another Christian? And it's like, yeah, but if you feel guilty about what you did to me for the rest of your human life, that's on you. And maybe you should feel guilty for the rest of your human life for what you did to me. And that feels gratifying, doesn't it? Feels good. No, nah, it's not what he wants. No, I don't want you to be in misery. That's love. That's a whole different level of love. I think about, I think about this kind of forgiveness. And I think about two other places where, where Jesus also gave us a whole different level of forgiveness, okay? If you checked out earlier, check back in for just a second here. You really need to hear this. Do you remember when Jesus was there with the woman who was caught in adultery and they were about to stone her and he said, the person that's without sin, let them cast the first stone. So that's him taking that word forgiveness and saying, this is what it really means. It means that none of you are qualified to punish each other. That's part of the core of Christian forgiveness. You're not qualified to punish, so don't. And then Jesus gets on the cross and he gives us another whole angle of the whole thing. And he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And if you read that honestly, doesn't that kind of shock you a little bit? Because again, that's a whole different level of forgiveness. What do you mean we don't know what we... Like there's been days I knew exactly what I was doing. But Jesus comes and he he puts this whole umbrella over all of human sin and says, yeah, but they didn't get it. They didn't know how deep it ran. They didn't know the generations that would walk in this sin just because they started it. They didn't know the impact they were going to have on their community. They didn't know the curses. They didn't know all the things. They just didn't know. And there's an incredible mercy of Jesus that comes in and does that. And then Joseph comes in and he says, and I want you to forgive yourself. Stop beating yourself up. I'm not beating you up. I want our family to be reconciled. I want us to have barbecues, amen? amen? I want us to have a good time. I want the kids to run around and I want us to have peace. He's aiming for reconciliation. He's not, he's not just aiming for not vengeance. He's aiming for reconciliation. I love that. Can you get that into your soul? See, it's easy to read the Bible. It's easy to fast. It's easy to pray. It's easy for you to give money to the church. It is easy for you to serve on the team. It is hard to forgive. That's what's hard. It's hard to stop your little punishments that you do against your spouse every single day. You're standing in the kitchen and here's a little punishment and there's a little punishment and you know you deserve it. And in the living room with your kids and here's a little punishment and, there, and, 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 and on the phone with the extended family and here's a little, and these tiny little things where unforgiveness has just become, it's, it's so much the ocean that we swim in, we don't even know it's there. And that's what's hard. The song we sang earlier, it said, there's, there's no wall that you won't kick down. There's no lie that you won't tear down when you're coming after me. These are the lies that God's kicking down. This is the relentless love of God. This is the, rele- the reckless love of God that's coming after you today. Do you see how he's coming after you? He says, I won't let you live that old churchy Christianity where you explain away your unforgiveness? No, no, no. Like live the way of Jesus for real. This is where the rubber hits the road. Amen? Amen. Because revenge will rot you. Why don't you guys stand and we'll pray.
as we pray, I just want to encourage you to remember that the Holy Spirit is present and he can see through to every single soul in this room and he knows us and he loves us and he's going to be whispering to you right now, talking to you, stirring you, nudging you about that particular thing going on in your life. And it's your opportunity to respond to him. Say, I will forgive. I will do this differently. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray that you would speak. I pray, Lord, supernaturally that you come to each of us right where we are. And God, we're all different. And unforgiveness, the the tiny little punishments in our lives, God, it, it looks different for all of us. But Lord, I pray that you would come and speak. Give us the names. Give us the faces right now. Lord, we've let this vengeful vengeful spirit into our lives. And we just thank you for Joseph right now, that he's such a picture of Jesus to us. Thank you that he went all the way with his forgiveness. What an amazing guy. Come, Lord, and sow into our families reconciliation, real reconciliation. Heal us, God. We love you. In Christ's name, amen.